Hey guys, welcome to BP, the Bible Perspective. Race, racism, and Jesus. <laughs> Is Jesus racist? Well, I want to continue my let's have an honest talk about racism in the church. And in this episode, I want to really deconstruct this argument that there is no such thing as white privilege. And, and I say the argument because that's really what it is, that there are people, and I'm going to say white people, white Christians, who try to argue that there is no such a thing. Thus, people like myself who constantly talk about race are only stoking hatred in America. Well, before I do, don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP The Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. You know, I like to call this argument, and again, I do say it's an argument. First, you start off with the premise of white privilege. Well, uh, there are people who will always look at where the weakness of an argument is, or the phrase, or the term, white privilege. Uh, but what is it? Now, 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 before I really get into it, let me tell you why I'm approaching it this way, and why I'm going to... I'm, taking or deconstructing a secular argument as we are talking about race, racism in Jesus, you know, racism in the church. And the sad thing is, <coughs> is that, excuse me, the sad thing is, is that in order to understand why Christians are racist, you got to understand why America is racist and what, what were the roots of racism in the church. And as I said, I'm going to go deep into some of these arguments. But I, 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 before we go through, there's something that I wanted to, uh, I, I, you know, in, in one of the videos I did on this very subject, a guy had responded to me. And I'm going to get to his response. And I'm going to deconstruct his, his argument. Um, but the idea of white privilege, and the reason why, I'm, again, I'm using this term, a secular term is because um, many white Christians today and those who engage me, whether Facebook or YouTube, will use some of the same arguments. Uh, typically, I find that it is a white conservative uh, argument or point of view. And again, we're going to eventually get to maybe the roots of it. But it is certainly expressed through mediums such as Fox News and other conservative talk radio uh, hosts and conservative uh, pundits, okay? And one of the arguments goes such like this, that there is no such thing as white privilege, that the racism, that slavery was, was ancient history. Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save it for when I respond to a guy who... Uh, um, uh, responded to one of the videos that I, I did here. Um, but think about this now. Have you, ever, have you ever heard someone say something like this? Or have you even said something like this? That I was taught to treat everyone the same. Um, and that may be true, but is that a reality? How about this one? I see people as individuals. Uh, no, you really don't. I guarantee you that when you go choose to go to the supermarket... You don't go to where you're not uncomfortable. And when you choose to live, there's certain neighborhoods that you probably don't move in. How about this one? Race doesn't have any meaning to me. And again, it may be true for some people, but um, it does. I mean, it's just a matter of perspective of how you mean. What, it, what does it mean? For example, race means a lot to me, but I put it in perspective of God's creation that God is a race God since he made different races he says my parents weren't racist so I'm not well that could be true and uh, if you were raised right but that's not always true I, I, again I want to just say that there there are people who they very when you talk about this issue of race and this is one of the biggest uh kind of a response. I don't know anyone that's racist. 
I've never heard anyone who used the N-word or things like that. And I always say, okay, I put a, I'm suspect of that, but I will take you at your word. But here's my thing. Your experience is not the sum total of anything. So the fact that you say that I've never heard anyone talk that way, um, let me just say, on the reality side, I don't believe you. But that's not an indictment against you. For example... I've heard people of all races say certain things. It's just we live in the world. So for you to say that I don't know anyone, well, I don't know if I believe that uh, fully. Let me um, show you. This was a video I did um, um, a couple of weeks ago. and probably was the start of this. And I said racism in the church. And then I said, can we have an honest talk? But here was a person. I don't know if he's a Christian or not. But he does, this, this, what I'm getting ready to read you, reflects, okay, reflects what people think, what white Christians think. And just so you know, yes, I'm going to get to some black people as well, okay, on the other side of it. But I wanted to re deconstruct this to show you how people think. And I want to say the argument of this. Now watch this. This is his, this is his response to this. He says, where again in the Bible does it say that we should be concerned about what color Noah and his sons were? Now, he's saying this because in the video, I made mention of the fact that there were people who in 2020 believe in the curse of Ham. OK, now, but the curse of Ham is um, a racist belief that God cursed Ham or cursed uh, Ham with dark skin. That's what people believe. And so the idea here was that uh, the reason why I'm questioning if his argument is sincere because clearly I said that in the video. In other words, that's what people believe. Now, other people believe, and this was used, um, that um, the uh, black people were cursed with slavery. And I had a, I had a, um, I was on a radio show a couple of weeks ago, <coughs> excuse me, where a person responded to that very thing. I posted this, I posted that phrase on Facebook, and a person actually, uh, this is a Christian pastor, and he invited me on the show, and we went to talk about it, and we never got fully to um, whether or not if he actually believed that, but he basically believed that. Um, Canaan or the sons of Ham were the descendants of black people. Now, if you go to the book of Genesis, um, and after the flood, you see God telling Noah and his sons, there were eight people, remember, that survived the flood, and then with Noah's sons, they repopulated the earth. Now, some people use that as a chart to say, well, what, you know, were certain people or the descendants of uh, the, um, the Noah's sons. So basically, Ham, but it, it's believed to be uh, uh, seeded black people, okay? And then, of course, if you believe that the curse of Ham, that was the black dark skin, my dark skin is a curse. Um, and then, of course, the other sons of Noah were European and different like that. And of course, white people, okay? Europeans, okay? Now, Honest people know that that's not necessarily true. But the idea of Canaan, the curse basically came from Canaan and not from, and, and, and not of Ham in and of itself. In other words, Ham had other sons, had other descendants. There was one particular uh, uh, curse, and it was a prophetic message that God had actually used. Now, the story happened like this. Uh, after the flood, um, God had told Noah and his sons, go repopulate the earth, okay? And again, they lived anywhere from four, five, six hundred years old, like that. And then, so there was a lot of seeding going on. Well, one day, um, Noah got drunk, and he was passed out. He was passed out naked. And Ham saw him. Now, there's a lot of inference and discussion as to, did he just look, or did he do something else? Anyway, what was reported is that he looked, and he went and told his brothers. Well, Noah awoke and realized, but well, first let me say this, his brothers took a sheet, right, 
and they went backwards, they put, took the sheet, put it on there, and went backwards and covered their father's nakedness. Now, when uh, Noah woke up and uh, realized what uh, Ham had done to him, and again, we don't know exactly other, what he meant other than if it was just looking or something else. Some people suggest uh, that it might have even been more deviant, okay? But at any rate, he uttered this phrase, cursed be Canaan, a servant to his brothers he will be, yada, 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 like that. So that's where that comes from. But it was Canaan, not Ham, and certainly not the descendants of Ham. All right, <clears throat> so, but that's what that was for. Then he goes on and he says this, and you seem to possibly be confused on the phenomenon of white flight. We don't move, so now he's white, identifying himself as white. We don't move because we don't like black people, my brother. It's because the neighborhoods become less safe. Think about it. Detroit, is Detroit safe? Chicago, Compton, Memphis? No, they aren't. Now, <laughs> so let's deconstruct this. And this is something what I'm saying is people think this way. White people think this way. So he mentions um, what? Uh, uh, Compton, let's see, one, two, one, two, three, four. Uh, four major cities, right? Okay, big cities. Which is silly. So, obviously, what he means is the black part of those towns, right? So, Detroit, Chicago, Compton. And so, he means the black part. Chicago, by the way, I, I live in the Chicago area. So, he's basically going to say the west and south side where predominantly blacks live, okay? And then Compton, which is known. By the way, Compton has changed, brother. It's all Spanish, mostly Spanish now. But Memphis, and by the way, Memphis has changed. I remember Memphis back in the day used to be a wonderful city, but it's very, it is violent, and Detroit's violent. Okay, but here's what you have in each case. See, and this is where media comes from, how you paint pictures, how you paint someone, how you picture so the entirety of the black community in either one of these cities is not crime written. In other words, it's not wild, wild west. By the way, the city that I live in, if I was to open it windows right there and show you the town I live in, is 80% black. It is not crime written. I've not been here for over two decades. Okay? My house never got broken, never got mugged, never got shot. But don't misunderstand me. Let me be fair. There are knuckleheads that move from time to time that come in and think they're thugs and things like that. Okay? Here's my point, what I'm saying. That all these black cities that he named are major metropolitan cities. And I, okay, we could be fair and throw in a whole lot of other cities. Pretty much every major city has its crime-ridden area. Okay? And there are crimes unique to the black community. For example, gun violence. But here's the thing about this. Gun violence is the, the bulk of the gun violence that you see on the news, okay? is drug and gang related. In other words, it's not just black people doing it. But here's another interesting thing, my brother, okay? And that is this. White people go to these neighborhoods. Now, I remember years ago, a person said to me once, you know, I, I wouldn't be caught dead in that part of the white guy. He said, I wouldn't be caught dead in these black neighborhoods. And I, I was, I remember responding to him saying, saying, brother, you would be more, you would probably be safer than I would in certain parts of the black community. Why? Because if you, a white person, goes there, they're not going to mess with you for several reasons. One they're going to hmm, probably assume that you're there to buy drugs or prostitutes or maybe you're a cop or crazy. Now, killing a white person in there, they don't want that kind of heat. So in other words, white people are not dropping like flies when they go to black neighborhoods, and they do for those reasons. So you see, there's a lot of perspectives here when you talk about that. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not telling you to go to these neighborhoods either. I don't go to them. I don't go to crime-written areas. 
what I'm simply saying is that that's not the sum total of um, the black experience. It's what you see on television and how the media conditions your mind. Um, there is a, a video. Uh, no, I'll get to that later. Um, another thing I want to say about this um, idea of black neighborhoods, because again, I live in a black neighborhood. Okay. Um, that wasn't even the point, though, that he was making, that he never backed up either. The point that I made was I made a statement about a white pastor in a middle class neighborhood. And this South City, this suburb for years was a middle to upper middle class town. It was a very religious town, by the way. OK, and the city is called South Holland and it had Dutch Reformed churches throughout as well as other churches. Uh, it, almost on every corner you had uh, uh, sp uh, sprawling churches in this neighborhood. It was a full of church and it was a dry town. And it was also white. Now, during the 90s, blacks started to move into the uh, suburbs. And so, this is what I was going to comment on. Uh, obviously, then the white flight started to happen. But it was even more of a phenomenon was that the churches, the white churches, fled faster than the white flight. And I happened to know one of these churches because I began to attend a church and me, me and my wife started attending. We, I think, in another couple were the only blacks in there. So maybe I think we were you know, two, three blacks in this in there at the time. Okay, that we attended. And it was a small church. I mean, you know, a small church, maybe 150, maybe 200 people like that. Okay. And um, and obviously, again, there, you could tell that that they had a, a conservative bent. Now, the pastor invited me to lunch. And so as we were eating lunch, I can't even remember how, because this is a number of years ago, I can't even remember how we got on this subject. But we started talking about race issues. And I got away, started reflecting this whole thing right here. And we're going to get to this in a moment. But he started saying things like, well, I don't understand why we got to talk about race is the issue right now. My ancestors came over on the boat. We never owned slaves. Slavery ended hundreds of years ago. Yada, yada, yada. Okay, then we kind of like, okay, then he said this. And again, this is what he said. He said, and, um, you know, we used to have a church, you know, in, in South Holland, and we moved because blacks were moving to the town. Now, remember what I said about South Holland? Even to this day, that there are a lot of blacks in this town, it still remains a middle class neighborhood. It is still a nice neighborhood, okay? Now, I'm going to say this, and in fairness, it may have its problems, as with all, but it's still pretty much, it is not a crime-ridden family, like, like when he says that people move because they're safe, unsafe. And th that's really, in my opinion, doesn't reflect that. I'm going to come back to that statement in a moment. Now, the point is, is that he moved his church because blacks was moving in. That's it. He didn't say because they were afraid. He didn't say all of a sudden now because we were being mugged and being robbed and being this. There was a fear, though, because that's what you've been conditioned to view black people. And keep in mind, this is the church, a pastor saying this. So I replied to him. I said, wow, well, if I had attended your church in South Holland, by the way, he moved his church 25 miles west of South Holland to a white flight area at the time. So I said, if I'd attended the church, um, you would have left me. Now, the reason why we went to that church is because they were affiliated with another church that we kind of knew. And that's why we went to that church. We didn't know about it when they were in South Holland. You know, his response was, oh, well, <laughs> Um, I tried to get a black pastor. Okay. I tried to get a black pastor. So <laughs> that's where this statement comes from. And again, where was the crime in this town? Okay. All right. So let me go on and read. Um, uh, 
He says, uh, and then, and when you imply that somebody is racist because they want their children to be safe, you are actually having the opposite effect on what you are going for, I believe. Now, first of all, I didn't say that. He says, you know, in other words, he's making an, um, uh, 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 a conclusion that I never made. In other words, the fact that you move your church. By the way, the fact that you move from any crime written situation. I never said that you were racist for doing that. In fact, let me just say this. If you saw four black guys walking towards you and they had dreadlocks, dark skin, baggy hip hop clothes, should you be concerned? Absolutely. You know why? Because people who dress like that do rob. Think about it. But you should be alert anyway with people, right, who dress that way. So on the one hand, yeah, you should be. You're not racist because, oh, guess what? Um, 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 I see four black guys, menacing looking black guys. But here's the problem, though. This is what he didn't say. This is what he didn't address. See how I'm dressed now? If a, white people saw me, they would still be equally afraid. You see, I'm going to get to police. Police, okay, police um, make no distinction between me, <laughs> the thug. They see this, black skin, and they will shoot, okay? Um, he says, you keep mentioning Jesus Christ. Did you know that the reason we actually go to church to learn his words and his teachings? We don't go to discuss slavery in the 1800s America. Now, <laughs> this was interesting, right? Uh, because he's not being honest here because, well, okay, you didn't, you didn't go to school to get a history lesson. But conservative churches talk secular stuff in their churches all the time, right? Literally all the time. And the whole point is that, as I can tell you, I can list churches, for example, like Bob Jones University taught. Churches teach all the time about doing in the 50s and 60s against segregation, integration, I should say. Um, so his point to say, what he's basically saying is, we're tired of this race talk. But the other question is, why are you tired of the race talk? And that's what we're going to get to. But the whole point is, he's saying, we're tired of listening to it. But yet at the same time, you talk about abortion, you talk about um, whatever the po political hot topics of the day are. So then he throws this thing in. And by the way, did you know your ancestors also owned slaves? Every single racial group is guilty. Did you know slavery is going on in this very minute in Africa? Far more brutal than the slavery that happened in America long ago. Yet nobody ever talks about it or tries to help them. See, that's a talking point when you say that. Nobody's talking about that. You hear that all the time. It's almost like you don't even really care about slavery at all, but instead just used to disparage and manipulate white people. Okay, let's unpack this. Let's go back. Um, he's again. He says that we first we don't want to hear about slavery in the 1800s. Do we want to hear about slavery in Africa today? Do we really care about slavery in Africa today? Because it's black on black slavery, right? Does he really care about slavery in Africa? But here's the greater point. And notice he says, did you know that your ancestors, right? Your ancestors sold slaves. Yeah, I did know that. Um, we did know. That's is old news that you had one African tribe who sold, uh, who would capture a weaker uh, African tribe and sold them off. But here's what he's not saying. Does that make the white man any less guilty for buying said slaves let's suppose let's suppose I go to Thailand 
the, the country right of Thailand. And it's known for that a man, a grown man, can go and get 10, 11 year old boys or girls and sleep with them. Now, certainly we can curse Thailand for their godless practice or allowing that. They're guilty of, yes, vileness without a doubt. But also, how about the men that go there, who travel there? In other words, if I find out my neighbor, your neighbor, your pastor or whoever, traveled to Thailand and had sex with 10, 11 year old boy or girl, would we not shame them? Would we not criticize them? Condemn them? So the fact that he says, your ancestors sold slavery, yeah, they did. But the white man bought them. And if you're going to then say that, then you've got to say that the white man was vile. But here's another thing. Here's another problem. The correlation between slavery, because notice he says everybody done it. This is another kind of an argument that everybody, slavery is nothing new to slavery. And that is true. Slavery is a part of the sinful condition of man. It's a part of human history. If you were weaker and somebody picked a fight with you, you probably became their slaves. But America and the Atlantic slave trade was the only time in history where one particular race was targeted. Not only that, <laughs> but America was the only nation who claimed to be Christian, who claimed to be godly, claimed to be on a higher moral stand, and who claimed freedom for all. It's on our doorposts. So think about that. It's on our doorposts. So the bigger question is, how hypocritical and vile and evil were America when you said, and it's written in the Constitution, right? That we hold these truths self-evident that all men are created equal and an endowed with inalienable rights by their creator, right? So the man who wrote that was a liar, wasn't he? Because he owned slaves. Not only did he own slaves, but he thought slaves were inferior. He thought blacks were inferior while sleeping with his slave fathering children with one of his slaves, you know, Sally. So you see, so even though, even though you want to say that Africa, Africa, yeah, they are, their religion, uh, pagan, Islam, they didn't claim to be the land of the free, but America did. All right, so, um... And then he says, nobody cares about it. Well, everybody cares about it because people are talking about, by the way, modern day slavery and also sex trafficking. Now, then he go, and you mentioned Philando Castile. I could just easily mention uh, Shannon Christian, Christopher Newsom. Don't know who they are, you say? I don't. Uh, it's because the media didn't care enough to make it anything but a local news story. And a footnote at that. <laughs> But the, but the render, or readers, I'm going to assume, but it, but it renders your point about Philando Moot. I don't know how. I don't know why. Now, let's, let's, let's kind of understand, I guess, I don't know what he meant, really means by that. But he, he brings up, when I mentioned Philando Castillo and other, how cops see black men. In other words, when the cop look at me, and remember I said that if you saw four black uh, guys walking down the street, you should be alarmed. You should be alert. You should be al at least alert. The problem is that uh, uh, I, I, to a white cop, to a cop who is conditioned to see black people a certain way, and this is my take, this is why we see unarmed black people getting shot. In the case of Philando Castillo, he was in an open carry state. And he did something even if he didn't have to do and he was pulled over. And by the way, the police officer targeted and they saw him. He saw a black man, a black man with braids. That black man had his girlfriend and his four-year-old daughter in the car. But the cop pulled him over, found a reason to pull him over. Because he thought he was a burglary suspect. 
he was coming from his job. We were coming from the store. And when he pulled him over, right, he was going to just, he was using his power to do that. It's police power. Pulled him over. Orlando said, just to let you know, officer, I have a gun. 53 seconds later, he was shot dead. What was the fear? What was the threat in an open carry state? And he shot this man, this man dead, right, in front of his four-year-old daughter. That's what this man is not talking about. And by the way, there was a dear sister who brought this up a number of years ago. And I was just, I, I, I kind of went in on him because, again, you know, cops just want to go home too. It's what she basically premised that conversation on. When a cop just tell you to do something, just don't do it. Did you watch the video? 53 seconds. There was another young uh, boy who was playing in the park. Uh, Tamara Rice. He was 12 years old. Cop rolled up on him within 15 feet and shot him in two seconds that he's been there. In other words, but well, we can go on and on and on with unarmed black men just getting getting shot. Of course, in the news right now, they're making the news. Right now, it's a story out of Georgia, right? When two white men decided, hey, we're going to stop this black guy. But they got their guns, right? They said, hey, this guy, we think this guy's breaking in or the burglary separate. Okay, even if that is true, he was jogging, by the way. How many uh, burglars are in jogging shorts and t-shirts? But see, they saw a black man and they said, hey, he's a burglary suspect. They cornered him, ended up shooting him dead. The story always goes on with that. And he said this story, my point about Philando was mute. <laughs> what mute? This kid, it always goes on. The bigger question is, why is it that you don't see unarmed white people getting shot as much as you do blacks? And let me just, let me just say something. Again, so this problem with he's talking about here, this is a condition of how he thinks, by the way. And then he finally says, now, if you have more productive uh, com conversations with atheists, have you considered it? It's maybe because you share the same father with them. He calls me unsaved, what he's doing. White good. Then he, 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 he puts this, white guilt trip failed. <laughs> right? And they failed. Okay. Now, first of all, I wasn't trying to make him guilty. Because remember, he responded. So what this is, is the old saying that if you throw a rock in, rock into a, in the middle of a pack of dogs, the one that yelp is the one that gets hit. He's yelping here. But the point is that, and I, again, I responded the same way I'm responding to you. I haven't heard back from him yet. And I wonder if I will. I said, if you really want to have an honest discussion, yeah, we can have one. Yeah, let's do. And we'll see if we respond back. But here's my point. The idea of white privilege, and this is what he's trying to mitigate, I mean, trying to say that it doesn't exist, and he's, and, he's, and he's trying to be smart about all of his arguments, but he doesn't really argue the facts. In other words, if you're going, you know, in other words, the fact of what did slavery do? The impact of slavery on a people for 400 years, that all they were taught is that they were a property. You're a nigger property. When the white slave masters can go down at any time and, and rape a female slave. And there was nothing this female, female slave can do. There was nothing that their children can do. There was nothing a husband could do. There was nothing that a sibling can do. What impact did it have when the master come and took one of the children and sold them off? See, broke up a family. We can go on and on and on. And by the way, there are legitimate points that he makes. It's just that he's making them from a white point of view. White privilege. When we talk about white privilege, by the way, the idea of white privilege is that if this brother or any brother, um, we were in 1950 in a uh, Woolworth lunch counter. And let's say I was a millionaire. Uh, Madam C.J. Walker was the first black millionaire. But do you know that in, in with all of her millions that she couldn't eat at a Woolworths counter because she was black. And yet a poor white who had no money 
could go in there and eat. See, that's the difference of privilege. Uh, obviously, Madam T.J. Walker, she was a millionaire for her time. That's what privilege is about, see. Madam C.J. had to enjoy her wealth on the black side of town. So the bigger issue to me is why do people make such arguments here? Because he's not being honest. And that's what, again, we're going to continue this discussion and I'm going to continue talking about this. I wanted to say this is the typical argument here about, uh, and again, it's full of flaws because you're not looking at um, all sides of the spectrum. I'm not afraid to talk about race. Like I say, let's have an honest talk and we are going to go deep. All right, guys, we'll continue this in another video. And don't forget to like and share this video and please subscribe to BP The Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or a comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. Till next time, I'll see you then.